So my name is Mark Dweck. I'm uh, a cardiologist from Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, I'm here at uh, Euro Echo 2017. It's a great privilege to be here in, in Lisbon, this fantastic city, and even greater privilege to be here with my friend and colleague uh, Gilbert Habib from Marseille, former president of EACVI uh, and the luminary in the field of uh, imaging. And uh, today we're going to talk to you about uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. We're going to focus on the uh, expert consensus statement that uh, we've recently published and uh, we're going to have a conversation about uh, imaging and its role in this, this interesting uh, disease or set of diseases really. So I guess we need to start at the beginning and uh, talk a little bit what is restrictive cardiomyopathy, what is the definition? I think that's almost the most challenging part of this conversation. So. Uh, <laughs> Over to you, where to answer that. Yes, I cannot answer this question. It's too <laughs> difficult for me, I would say. Uh, you know, when we wrote this uh, consensus paper about restrictive cardiomyopathies, I think the first task was really to find a good definition. It was difficult because the definition from uh, US and from Europe is not exactly the same. And uh, also because uh, uh, there are the discrepancies between, uh, between the guidelines and so. Uh, I would say that the true definition of a restrictive cardiomyopathy is the presence of a restrictive physiology, and the term physiology is very important. Restrictive physiology contrasting with theoretically a normal or near normal left ventricular volume, a normal and near normal uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, and normal or near normal uh, thickness of the septum. This is a quite strict definition huh? and uh, I think all cases of restrictive cardiomyopathies do not follow this strict definition in, in reality yeah. but it is typically this is the official definition of what a restrictive cardiomyopathy is. Yeah I think I agree with that I, we were just talking before that you know there are some exceptions so for instance amyloid a very common cause of restrictive yeah. cardiomyopathy often has increased wall thickness and so I think we have to be a little bit loose with it, but that's a yeah. great framework for, for starting the conversation. I um, think that exceptions are more frequent than the others, <laughs> in sorry. fact, in, the, yeah. in, in really practice. But what we try to do is to follow what I think is the best definition because it is a clinical definition. And yeah. this definition was given by the working group on cardiomyopathies and uh, pericardial diseases of the European Society of Cardiology. It was in 2008. It is not a perfect definition, but it is the one we have to follow today because it is based on the clinical presentation of the patient. And at the end, even if we know that genetic definition will be probably better, even, in the, even with this um, reason, we can uh, prefer using, we prefer to use this definition, the European definition, yeah. in the paper and to follow this definition. Yeah, yeah. so, um, well, I think that's, uh, that's clear. And I think what's interesting to me about restrictive cardiomyopathy is that unlike, say, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, this is not just one disease. This is a collection of different disorders, different etiologies, which now have different treatments. So in some ways, it's not good enough for us as images to say, you have a restricted cardiomyopathy. We have a duty then to take it a step forward yeah. and say, right, what is the cause of that restricted cardiomyopathy? And what treatments can we give you to make you feel better? So. I think that's why it's an interesting group of conditions because it poses that challenge. Yeah, I think you focus on the most important point and what has changed in the management of such patients. Now when we receive a patient with hypertrophic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, mm. we don't want only to make the diagnosis, we want to focus on specific etiologies with possible specific treatments and now we have, for yeah. example, the first thing we have to think about is amyloidosis, but also uh, mitochondrial cardiomyopathy, which is one case or form of uh, restrictive sometimes cardiomyopathy, Fabry disease, etc., etc. So yeah. now we can propose something to the patient. And also, I would say that genetics is very important in this patient as well. Yeah, definitely. And it will be increasingly important in the future as we understand yeah. better how that, that works. So um, I guess that the next question is, okay, well, We've defined it, we know what it, what it is, so how are we going to image it? What's the, what's the first step in our imaging 
strategy for, for these conditions? I think the answer would be simple. Eco is the best, as usual, and you have to begin that. Without joking, I think we need, in this special population, to begin with eco evaluation because eco is the first step to make uh, a first diagnosis and to orient for an etiology mm. and also for giving the physiology, physiologic part and to define what is the type of diastolic dysfunction, the restrictive pattern, and we know that ECHO and Doppler is very useful uh, in, uh, for this point. But ECHO cannot be alone because we need additional techniques to go further into the diagnosis in this patient and particularly for the etiological diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think as you said, you know, just, just before that the diagnosis of restrictive cardiomyopathy it depends on establishing the restrictive physiology and you know echo is by far and away the best way that we have of doing that and looking at the hemodynamics and physiology of it and then as you say after that then once we get into the question okay what is the cause of that restricted cardiomyopathy then i think the other imaging modalities come into play so we can start to use mri to look at the uh the structure of the myocardium get tissue characterization try and work out is it amyloid does it look more like sarcoid for instance then we can use nuclear techniques to perhaps differentiate uh, different forms of amyloid, uh, use FDG to look for active cardiac sarcoid, even UCT to try and make that crucial differ differentiation between restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive physiology, looking for pericardial thickening, etc. Yes, but clearly I think there is no opposition between techniques by really complementarity. Well, just one thing I would add for echocardiography is something a little bit paradoxical, yeah. is that the world is restrictive cardiomyopathy, but we don't find a restrictive pattern in all cases of restrictive cardiomyopathy. And echo is very important on this point because mm. what we call restrictive pattern by echo and Doppler is more associated with the clinical condition of the patient than one moment and also to prognosis. I take one example. Yeah. Amyloidosis is the most typical form, uh, classical form of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Yeah. However, we know that half patients with amyloidosis have restrictive pattern mm. and the other have non-restrictive pattern. And this patient, mm. this is an additional role of HECO and Doppler is the prognostic value because patients with the restrictive pattern yeah have the worst prognosis. So yeah. this is a bit confusing, but it is also the reality. Uh, restrictive physiology yeah. by Doppler is not found in all cases of restrictive cardiomyopathy, but restrictive physiology by Doppler is associated with worse prognosis. Right. And this prognostic information is also important as well. Absolutely. And of course, the patients that we're seeing in front of us want to know about what their outcomes are likely to be. Yeah. So we have to try and give that information. So um, I guess there's a, one kind of final thing for me is what do you think the future of imaging and restrictive cardiomyopathy might be? How, what are we going to be doing over the next five, ten years compared to what we're doing just now? Well, I think uh, what is important is how the use of uh, imaging techniques may modify the management of our patients. I, I will take one very simple example uh, again is the one of cardiac amyloidosis mm. because it's really the combination of echo, uh, CMR mm. and nuclear techniques. Right. And there is a new algorithm which have been proposed mm. based on these findings yeah. and particularly scintigraphy yeah. and uh, with also biological analysis. Mm. And at the end, when we use these techniques, we can um, uh, have a sufficient orientation not to need to perform uh, endomyocardial biopsy. So this yeah. is one of the things for the future, how to use the new techniques, the new technologies yeah. to avoid invasive first, invasive uh, techniques, and also to manage Absolutely. therapy and follow the patient. This is really the yeah. role, and also to have the etiological diagnosis. Thank you very, very much, Gilbert. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, I enjoyed the Congress, and I enjoyed the, the paper as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.